you know what? I'm a musician, and there's a certain guy, when we get together, there's a chemistry in the room where we can write good music together. And there was a little flow of that chemistry here, not musically, but, you know, ministry. So I sat down with Kelsey Wells and Steve Matthews, and we began recording the first part of our uh, series going through the Staff of Moses. Um, for those of you who don't know, The Staff of Moses is a really important book for the World Mission Society Church of God. It contains a lot of their uh, arguments and defenses against groups like Christianity. Basically, we want to devote a whole video to each chapter. And so we're going to walk through this book chapter by chapter, responding to some of these arguments um, of the WMSCOG. But as we were sitting down and recording that, we got a ways into to that first chapter, and we kind of got off a little bit into to a different conversation. Uh, and I just kind of let that conversation go where it went because it felt like uh, just a really important point that we were discussing. And so we kind of deviated for a while off of the staff of Moses. We went into this whole other conversation. It went on for, for 45 minutes to, to almost an hour, and I just kind of let it go there. And then uh, after that, we did get back. We finished the, the first uh, Staff of Moses video. Um, and so you can be looking for that to come soon. But I, I basically just pulled this separate conversation out of that um, and kind of made, made it its own video because I thought the things that we covered and the things that we talked about are just really important issues. Issues of the experience of, of members in the WMSCOG, um, you know, what, what is this group offering you? You know, if you're a member, is the WMSCOG really getting you to a place in your life that you want to go? Is it really, is it changing you as a person into a more loving person, uh, a, a person who has peace and joy and hope in life, a person who is uh, doing better at, at loving those around you? Uh, how's it affecting your relationships, your friendships, your relationship with your family? Is it helping those things or, or is it destroying those things? And so Kelsey, as a former member, kind of talks a lot about uh, some of her experiences in the group and how, I mean, really she was just miserable. She got to the point where she was just miserable as a member. And this is the overwhelming consistent testimony that we're hearing over and over and over again from, from those who have been a part of the WMSUG. And I think that what Jesus offers, what Jesus promises for those who follow him and believe in him, there's such a stark contrast between what Jesus has promised and what members experience. So how is the WMSCOG helping you in that area? How is it helping you in the area of, of conquering sin? Not just that you don't do you know, sinful things, but is it, is it helping you to have victory over sin in your heart? If the answer to that is no, then I think you need to see that there's a problem there. And so, yeah, I think this is a helpful conversation. That's why I pulled it out. I made it its own separate video. I just wanted to share it with you guys and let you listen. Please consider the things that are said here. And uh, yeah, uh, I just, I hope that as you listen to this, that you're blessed by it, that you're encouraged and, and pushed to really think about um, the, the contrast between what you might be experiencing as a member of the World Mission Society Church of God and what Jesus has promised to give those who uh, follow him. Man, when I was a member, they had us reporting every single person we talked to. We had to count it. And so they would actually have a tally within the churches, and I think they would be reporting the numbers of exactly how many people we reached out to every week, every month, whatnot. We had to record those numbers. Like it was, it was awful because I can never count, I can never remember to count someone, and so I'd get rebuked for not, you know, counting a soul or whatnot. But I, I could tell you, seven billion did not mean seven billion to them because I, you know, I went to the church in Oregon. And, you know, they told us back in 2017 that, you know, Oregon was done with the gospel work. And so they had us, you know, doing, you know, mission trips to like Uganda, you know, because they said Oregon's done with their gospel work. But, you know, I've since learned since I left that uh, they're still expanding. They're still preaching in Oregon. So it's, and, and, but, you know. And not the homeless either, right? Those people are done. Oh, no, no homeless, no so disabled. So there's certain people of the 7 billion yeah. who are not really eligible to be part of that 7 billion. Correct. Correct. You're not really right. preaching to the 7 billion people. Yeah. Handicapped people, gay people, right. homeless people. 
Right. Their souls don't matter to God. Uh, well, the, I mean, they don't say it that way, but they definitely but that's don't what let it comes us down preach to, to those folks. There's yeah. a very big difference between Christianity with their soup kitchens on, you know, Skid Row, you know, right. where we actually genuinely care about people. Right. I mean, anyone listening to this again, why does your church not, is very selective on which souls? Didn't Jesus say, you know, he came to reach everybody and to go yeah. out into the highways and byways and those who are, you know, bad news. Right. He didn't just say, you know, okay, well, these people are going to be good, you know, influence on the church and have money. And, you know, these are the problems. It's, it's, it's and, just ridiculous. And when I was a member, I saw, I saw one time a man who was clearly homeless. He walked into the church building when we were having like dinner time and he asked for, you know, if he could eat with us. And the two of the brothers quickly came in and escorted him out. So it's, well, that yeah, wouldn't happen yeah. in most Christian churches. And yeah, I think well, um, I, I want to. I'll I'll put my member hat on, although I never remember. But I'll put well, I can, I can, yeah, yeah, I still say, do that too. I'll, I'll say no. That's that's not true. My church does preach to the homeless, and, and I've had many people tell me. And I'm just going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say I I believe you. I believe that some maybe some Zions do welcome homeless and handicapped. I I don't know. I I don't want to whitewash this as every single church. There's always going to be the exception. But, but we've heard it from so many ex-members across the country. It doesn't happen. There's enough evidence to say that, okay, maybe your specific Zion does. I, I would question that, and I, I would want to see some evidence that that's happening in a meaningful and substantial way. But even if that is the case, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt there. But if that's the case, we still have overwhelming evidence and testimonies from multiple multitudes of other people from England and from all over the country that say that they're they're told to not preach to these people. Right. And, and, so, and one more thing, if if you guys fix that because you're trying to do your, you know, good works for your fragrance, you know, you want to do like uh um, you know, your beach cleanups and your blood dries and all of a sudden now you're going to start suddenly caring for the homeless? Well, guess what? You haven't done it for a long time. You know, God's true church has not been doing this for time. Directed by, right from God, where where's that presence been until, if you always ever make a change, why weren't you doing it from the day one? And to do it, and to now start doing it, as as I think the WMSCOG does with multiple things, they'll, they'll, they'll hear their criticism and critics, and then they'll start to respond exactly. and start to fix those things. To do that is the... the is about the clearest example you can see of, of what Jesus said not to do, which is doing your good works in, to be, be seen. seen by others. Like you're being seen you by others reward. that you're not doing good, these good works. So your your core motivation to begin doing these good works is people are seeing that we're not doing it. So we got to start doing this. Like that's not, that's not what God's asking of you. That's not what Jesus wants from you. Jesus doesn't want you to go help the poor and, and preach to to the homosexual community simply because people are criticizing you for not doing it. Like that's, that's hypocrisy. That's fake. It's not real. And so you I, have all, all, that, the eyes of men. all that to say, <laughs> uh, again, I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt to anybody, any of you who are going to comment and say, well, my church, my Zion, we do preach to the homeless. Okay. I'll give you that. Maybe you do, but most, I would I would say most, or at least a huge number of the Zions, the overwhelming majority uh, in my experience, and it seems like in Kelsey's experience and Steve's experience, yeah. and in so many other, you know, probably hundreds at this point of members and former members I've talked to, they do not do that. And and I want to point out that I attended two different Zions or two different WMSCOG branch churches. And it was the same, in my experience, it was the same rules uh in both churches you know when i attended the one in oregon you know we did have a member who was you know disabled but that member was a family member of a current existing member and that right. person was told this this person that you're bringing in is your responsibility hmm. and i saw various activities were set up like volunteer activities were set up that you know this person who's disabled couldn't participate and she was told she couldn't participate so, yep. you know, it's, so it's this, this was my experience. This is, I can't, you know, there's always going to be, you know, an exception somewhere, but you know, my experience, you know, for different branches of the same church is the, the same. So this is a problem. Mm -hmm. It is a problem. It's, I think it's undisputable that the WMSCOG has a problem with, with 
not with, with uh, taking not the gospel loving, to the whole world. Yeah, and not loving the the least of these, the low of the low, and that's just what we're hearing from testimonies. And so, again, you might argue against that and say, "Well, my Zion does," but all that says to me is that that it's it's a problem. But all you're saying is, well, it's not a problem where I'm at, or, or maybe it's not as big of a problem or as widespread of a problem as, as you think. And well, okay, that's fine, but it's a problem. It's something that does exist in the group and yeah. is, a, is a clear uh, indication of, a, of an organization who fits very well in the category that the Pharisees fit into uh, of of looking at the sin, the sinners, the, the, the worst, the, the gross people of the world and wanting nothing to do with them. But these were the very people that Jesus went to. These were the kind of people that, that Jesus had com- the greatest compassion right. for and was closest to, because that's the kind of God that we have. Um, he's not right. a God that looks at the homeless man, the guy who can't walk, who can't provide, who can't provide ties because he can't have a job. He doesn't look at those guys and say, oh, that guy's not you know, he's not really worth having around. That's that's the kind of person that our God actually wants to be close to because that's the person who has the greatest need. And, uh, look, and so, look in the Gospels where Jesus went out to people on pallets and stuff. You know, the kind of untouchables, the lepers, right. you know, those who are rejected by mainstream leper, yeah. society. Look, he went out there, you know, doing this, you know, and it's, it's, just, it's just such a contrast between, you know, the false you know, Christianity of the WMCOG and, you know, true Christianity. Where is your salvation army? Yep. Open your churches, you know, once a month for the homeless community to have a meal, you know, it's like these kind of things. And they like, my, again, my, I can only speak to my experience, but my experience is that whenever we even did a volunteer activity, it was never done without contacting the media first so that they knew, hey, we're going to be mm. there. And it was all about making, I mean, we always had to even wear like the same, um, the same like bright yellow color shirt. It was yellow yeah. shirt, blue shirt. I mean, it was. So it, people were just ties, really but, aware that but, you were but, there. So that, that you know, you were... a bunch of people are all in this area yeah. cleaning up and cleaning up or doing some kind of activity where, you know, were hard to miss, you know. So they need I mean, to read that... the Sermon on the Mount <laughs> about, yeah. you know, yeah. you have your reward. But you know what? We can do so much. Like I said earlier, there's such a mountain of evidence against it. You know, I didn't want to get you off track on here. uh, Well, that's that's a good point. And I think what, again, to summarize that, it's like maybe it's not uh, uh, a 100% issue everywhere. I would would say it's probably an issue even in the places that might, might be welcoming the the homeless and those in some measure i don't i would have strong doubt that they're doing it in a way that's coming forth from an actual loving selfless sort of act i think a lot of those scenarios are where there's family members in the church who have handicapped family and so it's kind of like well what do we do like we, we want this member you can't tell so the member your to, family can't get baptized right. yeah. and so, so maybe two it's not to it like you know the all-knowing mother god should be kind of fixing this problem, number one. And number two, you know, when God comes into your life, he changes your heart. You know, we they say you used to laugh where you once cried, you cried where you once laughed. And people going through the motions in the church of God, it comes down to the people, not just the leadership, but the people, because it should be in the hearts of the people to go out there and do these things just in and yes. of themselves, like we find in Christianity. Right. But right. it's the church is going to say, oh, don't do this. Stop it. You know, we need to, you know, they're the ones shutting it down. Yep. You know, they say, go preach to these people instead. It's it's heartbreaking. Jesus yeah, I was died. Told, he shed his blood for all these people. Yep. I mean, I was told not to volunteer unless it was with the church when I was a member. Yeah. But I just, I think, Steve, what you just said is – is another significant thing that honest, honestly continues to be like this um, confidence booster for my own faith in Jesus, because I see some, sometimes here, here's me just being candid. I question everything. Sometimes there's some days where I'm just like, is any of this true? Like these guys are obviously it's, it's obviously possible. I'm looking at the WMSCOG. I'm looking at Mormons. I'm looking at Jehovah's witnesses. I'm looking at, junk going on in, in, you know, Christian circles. And I'm like, is any of this true? But, but there's certain things that continue to 
to just be these solid things that I just can't get around. And one of those is what you just mentioned. The the I to me this undeniable difference between somebody who's following Jesus and has a true transformation of the heart, who by their own compulsion is going out self-sacrificially and giving to the poor, welcoming the lowly, uh, you know, stopping on the side of the road in secret. And secret. And secret, stopping along the side of the road when they have an appointment somewhere, getting this homeless guy in their car. Uh, I, I know people, followers of Jesus that I look up to who have brought homeless guys to their house, let them stay for several days, paid for their plane tickets to fly back home across the country, and, and they've done it. And, and then not only that, but it's kind of this idea that Jesus says, don't just, if somebody asks for your coat, you know, give them your, your tunic as well, or, or, or like go the extra step. And I see that happening in Christians around me. I see, so not only did he send him home, fly him home, but then he continued to follow up with calling him and like checking in and just like, it, and all that, what that is, is that that's love. That That's genuine, real, love and like substantial love that is actually working itself out in, in reality. And so there's a real love. There's a real change of heart. There's a real working of the real Holy Spirit that transforms people's hearts. And there's a false form of that. Um, mm-hmm. There's a there's a form of that that is is false. It, it's fake. It's phony. It might look polished and nice and pretty on the outside, but inside it's empty. It's full of dead men's bones. And so when I when I'm closely working with groups like the WMSCOG, it's like, it's forced me to see that so clearly. Um, It's forced me to see that there is so much fakeness. There's so much Mm -hmm. white polished outsides with, with dead rotten insides. But then I look and I'm not, I'm not saying Christianity is perfect as a whole. When I'm speaking to individual people who I've seen in my life that are following Jesus, that are truly changed people uh, that are humble for everything people, for that them is for the people. organization it's for the church right. you know we're the salt of the earth we do it for people in secret or no one will ever know we've given them this money or do this for them and you know if we have a girl who's trying to you know border baby we can talk to her in private no one will ever know we don't have to go and tell anybody hey i just saved the baby today you know this is between us and the lord and, um, you know, we're not, we don't want a reward on earth. We want a reward in heaven. And, and these groups, it's a real pattern. All they do is they want to just do everything for the group, the organization, instead of mm. just doing it for the sake of that person who's at the lowest point in their life, who's hurting, who's scared, who's alone. And we are Christ to them in this world. And, you know, we're not doing it for our church, for organization. We're doing it unto the Lord. We're not doing it to the, you know, unto the yep. cult, unto the church. I'm not doing, when I help someone, I'm not doing it unto my church. I'm doing it unto the Lord. And he knows, and he'll be the only person who knew I ever did that. And I don't have to PR and turn on the cameras and do it for the church. Right. The Queen's Award again, or whatever, you know. Yeah. And once again, I don't want to whitewash it. I'm not accusing every single individual as being a, a genuinely unloving person. I don't know every person in the WMSUG. I don't know every person's hearts and I'm not making that judgment about them. What I'm making a judgment of is the overall organization and the characteristics that I see in, I would say a lot of members, the majority of members and their their actions. And so again, I'm not accusing every individual who might be listening saying, you're just a nasty, I'm like, that's, that's not our purpose here. We're just trying to get you to stop and think about the fact that this is, uh, again, another serious problem. Like, I think if you just stop and listen to what we've said, look around at this organization around you, look around at the people around you that you're living around, look at what you're being taught, look at what it, the kind of person and the character that it's leading you to. Is this group really leading you to be that kind of loving person that I just described? Again, I'm not describing me. I'm describing a a friend of mine. I'm describing other people that I see. Is it, is it doing that? And if not, if it's, if it's making you into something other than a loving person, then I, I'm telling you, you're missing, you're missing the point of everything that Jesus taught. Um, Because Jesus said all the laws fulfilled in this one word, love your neighbor as yourself. And if you're missing that, you're missing everything. If the WMSCOG and all they're doing, all their passion about Passover and feasts and Sabbath and tithing and second coming Christ and mother God, if all of that is not leading to people being transformed into people who have loving, humility, self-sacrificial hearts, 
then it is an entire waste of time. It, it is a heap of garbage, to put it bluntly. That's, that's yeah, what I've, it is. I've even taken a step further, Jordan. I mean, before I even say that, I was going to think, I was thinking of Isaiah 64, Isaiah 64 6. It says, All our righteousnesses hang as filthy rags in the eyes of God. And I mean, even the best thing you do, you give all your stuff and your time, it's still a filthy rag in God's eyes. But I was going to say, taking that even a step further, I'd almost say that, you know, if you're going to do it for your church, then it isn't for love. There is no yeah. love. You're just doing it for points with the church or PR right. or whatever for a church, unless you're doing it for the right reason, which is just between, you know, between unto the Lord, just maybe just him, the person you're helping and God seeing, you don't have to ever report it to anyone. <clears throat> if you're not really doing it for that, then it's not even love in the first place. It's just a, and, a empty work. Exactly. And listen, I'm not, we're not just saying this to you. This applies to me too. This applies to Steve. This applies to Kelsey. Me, any, anything I do, including this YouTube channel, including this video, if it's not coming from a place of like me loving and caring about those who I'm talking to, which is what I strive for, which is what I have to constantly look in my own heart and see, okay, what's my motivation? And so I keep coming back to, I just feel compelled that a lot of you guys are, have been dis, uh, what do I want to say? Are, are, miss, are missing out. You're missing out on peace and truth and life that is in Jesus. And even, it, it, you know, for us, it's uh, what matters is, is love. Are we loving people? Or is our faith in God, is our knowledge of who God is and how much he loves us, is that changing our minds in such a way that we genuinely love other people in a way that we are willing to pick up the homeless guy on the road and buy him a plane ticket and then continue to check up on him. Not because anybody's watching us, not because we're getting points tallied up on the, the board, but because we love the guy. We care about him genuinely and, because and we know how much what, God cares about us. And what's hilarious is the this book says we are the opposers. And that's the reason mm -hmm. we're doing it because we're you know moved by Satan to to reach out to these, well, they would say to oppose the group. We're not opposing you to be used by Satan. We love you guys. Trust us. We Everybody on this video, we've got better things to do than mm -hmm. to be on here, on this video, spending countless hours researching and going on websites. We could be, you know, Netflix zombies during this whole time. But what are we doing? We're spending our time our precious hours to learn this material so that we could reach out to you. Um, you'll see this in Acts 17 when Paul is on Mars Hill. You know, he quotes the pagan poets against them. He was familiar. He said, is it not written in your own authors? You know, in him we move and live and have our being. He's actually quoting the pagans against the pagans to make his point. He was familiar <coughs> with the literature of the pagans in order to evangelize them. The same way, you know, we are understanding your material, we're weighing it. We're looking at it. We're, we're weighing it internally, biblically, externally, with Ansung Hong himself said on it, and it doesn't stand the test. It's very it easy, you know, to go through life and not to think and just go, you know, live in fear. You know, the whole, the whole mentality of being a, a, a gospel worker in the WMCUG <coughs> is you live by fear, shame, and guilt. And that's your whole life, day after day after day. It's not coming from a place of love and coming for, you know, to be more like Jesus and to be sanctified. None of that stuff. It's all, and you know that. You who are listening to this, you know that. If you're going to be honest with yourself, you're not having a happy, fun life. You want to tell people, oh, come join our group. You're going to have such fun and happiness, you know, with all the, the brothers and sisters of Zion. But inside, right now, you who are listening to it, you know you do not have that joy. You know something's missing. You know mm. that you're living under, you know, Kelsey's been there. <coughs> Excuse me, the, the fear, shame, and guilt, the big three that, that drives everything you do in this group. And it's, it's no way to live. You know, Jesus came to give you an abundant life, an amazing life, not a life. None of us here on this video are living by fear, shame, and guilt. You know, the good works we do in private to be rewarded by God, you know, that's that's nothing for us to to you know we would have a reward before men and you know I would just challenge you again you know this group you know that you're in you know it seemed right to you it seemed like these arguments are so good you know you look at staff of Moses to kind of solidify yourself and say hey this is why you know we really do have answers to these opposers 
But again, you know, look at your life. Are you happy? You know, are you living in fear? Are you giving away 40% of your money? Are you giving away almost all your time? How's your relationship with your family? How's your relationship with your old friends? You know, are you, are you moved by love for people or is it fear, guilt, and shame? Kelsey, you've been there. Fear, right. You and know, it, guilt and shame. And, you know, when I was a member and I'd be going out preaching, you know, I would preach to people and, and, you know, the vast majority of people don't want to listen. But, you know, you, you know, maybe in a night you might get at least one person that when you're preaching to them, you show them, you know, Revelation twenty two seventeen. you show, you, you know, your whole argument, bride is God the mother. And people, some people get really excited to hear that. And then you keep going and people are excited to see what you have to, you know, what you have to say. Um, but the thing is, is like in the back of my head, I'm like, you know what? They're going to, if they accept this, their life is going to be just mm. as miserable as mine. Exactly. Is. Their, mm. their life is, I mean, you know, I'm acting like I'm happy. I'm acting like this is, you know, the greatest thing ever, like that I'm on the right track. But in, you know, I hate, like I, I got to the point where, you know, like there were certain days of the week that I think Thursdays were my favorite days of the week because that was like the one day where I had, you know, a day break between, you know, when I, you know, I was expected to be at church. It like, it, it was just, I mean, I, I used to weight. look at people with There's such a weight, right? Right. Well, mm-hmm. I, yes, because I mean, you're you're required to go to the church every single day, and if you don't, you get this like inward guilt, like I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And even though I would do like preaching activities, you know, in the city where I live by myself, but you know, just the fact of not going there, it was like. And I was like, oh, they're going to see me as lazy. They're going to see me like I'm not, you know, doing the gospel work. I said, my, you know, my preaching's not going to count the attendance. They're going to call you for not showing up? Well, I mean, it, that kind of weaned after a while. But, you know, they, they do no, pressure you. Weans, especially, they, they do pressure you to show up. Like, even, even on, like, Saturdays when you have, like, after the first service, you have, like, what's called your group meeting because everybody's divided in groups. And in my group, they, because we were the young adult females, um, and so they would take like, they, they would go around saying, okay, you, Kelsey, um, what days can you come to the church? You next you, what days can you come to the church? And they would say like, you know, we need to come as much as possible. You know, this is where God dwells. Um, it's better to be together with brothers and sisters and to be alone and things like that. And it's like, you're, you know, you're taught to say, you're taught to say, and maybe even like to some level believe that your life is great but when you actually look at it it sucks and i remember supposed looking to give at a other... fragrance like the fragrance oh, where well, everything's going so people good. made people made those up all the time let me tell you <laughs> people made those the, up the all fra- the time you want a fragrance but, it stinks to be a member you know this I mean, is the enemy of fun i, I mean it, it 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 was it was really and, and like the longer you'd been in there the harder it got and because you would see other, you'd go to work and you see, you know, coworkers like, man, these people get to enjoy their lives. You know, they get, a, they get a rest on Saturday. Meanwhile, you know, I've had to, you, my Saturday has been occupied for 10 years and it's going to be occupied for the rest of my life. And it's, you know, you really start to envy people seeing like, I mean, that's where I got to the point where I was like, you know, I'm looking at everybody else and like, wow, their lives are great. They can do whatever they want. They can enjoy life, but I'm stuck. Well, how's your life now? How's your life now under the Lord where you're not under the crushing weight, the guilt, the shame? I mean, you get up wanting to serve God with joy and happiness and freedom because you're doing unto the Lord, not some organization of people who are, you know, counting on an Excel spreadsheet how much money you gave or, you know, how many meetings you missed and calling you and harassing you. It's all from the heart. It's, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, my life's a lot better, a lot better. A lot better now. I mean, it took a, when when you when I first la- left, like I think um, uh, Brian mentioned this, you know, when he was talking to you, Jordan, is that when I first left, like I literally felt like, like I, I literally was convinced that I was gonna go to hell, but I was okay with that because my life in the WMS was so much worse, in my opinion. I said if, if heaven was like the WMS COG, I don't want to go there, and um, because it was it was it was so. It was so, I don't know another word, better word, but it was so burdensome. So at this point in the conversation, we begin to kind of shift the focus over to the Sabbath. Steve's about to read a a verse in scripture that I just thought it was worth stopping here and just asking you to please listen to this this scripture, listen to what Jesus promises for those who uh, believe in him 
and contrast that with your experience in the WMSCOG. Kelsey made a, a, a statement just, just a few moments ago in the conversation. I don't know if you heard that. Other people get to rest on Saturdays. I don't know if you caught that, but that was something she said in the, I know she didn't even say it intentionally. I think that statement is true probably for the vast majority of you. When you consider what your Saturdays even have to look like, your Sabbath is a heavy burden that leads you to physical, emotional, and mental uh, exhaustion, spiritual exhaustion even. And is that right? Um, I think as you Again, listen to this conversation, listen to this, this passage of scripture Steve's about to read. And if your life with God, if your, your life of following God, if it's burdensome, heavy, defined by guilt, shame, and fear, then something is definitely wrong. It was so burdensome, you felt so guilty, you were never doing enough, you were, you know, you were always doing something wrong. And even when I left and before I started making videos, um, I had, you know, uh, I, I had met up with two, um, two of the, the members that I was pretty close with when I was in the church. And one of them said, you know, she says like, she's like, yeah, I, f I feel tired all the time too. And she's still in the church. And so like, there's, there's many people who like, they're, you know, they're tired. There's many leaders who are tired, but they're scared to leave because they're like, and, where else can I go? And the thing where is, is that the truth? a lot of times that tiredness, and I think that that suffering, that pain, that even that awareness that your life is hard and that other people's lives look better. I think what a lot of people in these situations do is they, they kind of fit that into the, the narrative of, of the WMSCUG and say, well, this is just me. I'm just suffering as a servant of God. You know, I'm, I'm enduring, I'm enduring right. suffering. And so they almost like turn that to make themselves kind well, of to continue to make themselves feel okay with, with continuing their lives that way. And one of the things that I remember being told when I went on a mission trip one time with them was uh, they said that when you get to heaven and you meet Apostle Paul, Right. And he tells you all the things he struggled for, for the gospel. What are you going to say? What are you going to say to him uh, about your struggle for the gospel? Wow. Or they say, Apostle Paul yeah. was shipwrecked for three days. You can't, you can't drive 30 minutes to the church <laughs> like that. I, I want to I share a verse. And a lot of Christians love this verse. And Jesus said, come to me, all mm. who are weary. Matthew 11. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He goes, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and we give you rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, gospel workers, is your burden light? Oh, you know, absolutely It's supposed not. to be light. If something's wrong, you got either, either Jesus is wrong or your church is wrong. If your, because it if wasn't your burden just is heavy... You're not doing mm -hmm. Jesus' way. Because your your burden is not just the act of preaching. Like, preaching is required. And you, in order to be considered an evangelist and do certain activities within the church, you have to preach a certain amount. You have to join a certain amount of preaching meetings every month. But the thing is, is like, the the preaching, it's not just going for preaching. You need to bear fruit. And bear fruit means recruiting members who get baptized, who start tithing, and who preach themselves and then bear fruit themselves. Um, so like, and it's not just a, you're responsible what? for them. You're responsible yes. for them. If they miss church, there's more burden for you. Right. <laughs> what did you do wrong that they're not showing up for church? So right? I was gonna, I wanted to read that same verse and you beat me to the punch and that's so good. And, and Kelsey, I don't know if you did it intentionally. Uh, but, but a couple minutes ago, you said you were looking around at other people in the world and thinking like, man, they, they get to rest on Saturdays. Did you say that oh, on purpose? No, I didn't do okay. that. Okay, right. that, <laughs> that, yeah. that is, is just a, a, an incredibly significant point and statement that your experience, this this overwhelming uh, like, like focus that the WMSCOG has on the Sabbath and their condemnation of, of people like me who don't think about it the same way. They're like, you don't keep the Sabbath, you don't keep the Sabbath. And then you being a member coming out of it saying, you didn't get to rest on Saturdays yeah. and looking around at people wishing you could rest on Saturdays. And with this emphasis in the WMSCOG on obeying the fourth commandment, obeying the Sabbath, 
And you're telling me that your experience of the Sabbath was the opposite of rest. Oh my this- God. You guys, like, let me tell you, <laughs> I want to tell you my, my average Sabbath schedule. Okay. Because this, well, this real was quick, this- three services. <laughs> oh, it's a three service. That was the easy Plus. part of the Sabbath day was the services. <laughs> that was the easiest part. Because, I mean, this, and again, this was my schedule for a long time, is that, you know, you get to church, let's say the service was at 9 a.m., right? So I had to be at the church by 8 a.m., sometimes earlier if my group is cooking and we need to do some prep work beforehand. So get to church 8 a.m., of course, you have to wear a suit, you have to have everything prepared, you have to have all your tithe money ready, um, because you're not allowed to go to the store to go get that. If you want, like, an energy drink, you have to have that prepared beforehand, because, again, not allowed to go to the store. So I'm getting to church at 8 a.m., I'm ready, any member that comes in, I need to greet them. Um, I need to have all my tithe uh, money and, and offerings in the envelopes. We go upstairs for the service, 8.30. We sit for 15 minutes for the new song stars, service time. Of course, we have to stay awake through the whole thing. And then 10 a.m., service is done. Then you have like a 10-minute break to use the restroom, whatever. And then you have to do your, your group meeting. And group meeting is like, oh, my God, that's like an hour and a half. And it's just it's, uh, it's the, the most boring thing. The most boring thing is because you have to you have to repeat all of mother's teachings. Everybody has to repeat mother's teachings, which are 13 of them. Um, and then you have to repeat fruits of the Holy Spirit. And then you have to you have to share fragrances, which take forever because, I mean, it gets to the point where no one's got anything. And someone says something and then somebody's like, oh, based off of that, that remind me of this. And everybody's piggybacking off of each other. So that takes forever. And then you have to. We had we always had to read uh, chapters out of um, Kim Ju Chol's books or An Sang Hong's books, and then we had to reveal fragrances from those, and then um, and then if there was time before lunch, we had to practice preaching. Guess, like for each of the subjects that you see, not only in that book but any of the sermon books, you have to get a certain amount of signatures before you can test. Um, we do lunch. After lunch, more practice preaching or a video that you've seen like a million times. Um, and everybody in my in my church, it was really small. So, I mean, there'd be like 12 of us cramped inside like a room no bigger than like a closet. It was just it was hot. A hot room. <laughs> yeah. Hot air conditioning never worked. It sucked. And then um, and then we have afternoon service. Another hour passes. And then after the service, more practice preaching. You don't necessarily get to choose who you want to practice preaching with. You're told who to practice with. You're not allowed to interact with anybody from any other group. Um, There's cameras everywhere. Yes, there are cameras. At least in my church, there were cameras. Um, A lot of Zions. Yeah, uh, inside and out. And, um, and, And then more practice preaching, dinner time. More practice preaching, or sometimes the, the the lower level course classes, and then evening service, and then after evening service, cleaning for an hour, and then if you're a leader, there's another like thirty minutes to an hour meeting based on who showed up, who didn't, whose faith is strong, who's not, and then you get to go home. So that was that was when I left. I That's well, there your were Sabbath. there were for a couple of years. Yes, for a couple of years in between the services, I had to take care of like 10 to 12 kids, most of whom were under the age of 10. And I had to take care of them the entire day. It was so hard. And I mean, if the kids didn't listen, I got in trouble for the kids not listening. It and hurts then the your tr- health. Well, and then they tell me how to discipline the kids and then I discipline the kids. Like I say, don't do that or don't sit with, you know, if they're, if they, you know, don't sit with this kid, you guys can't sit together and and act right. Then the parents would get mad. The parents would complain to the church. Church would get mad at me. And like, you told me to do this. And they said, well, you know, you didn't do it right. (laughs) It was like it was awful. It was awful. You couldn't win, and it was like I. There was me and, and some members that were who were the leaders. I mean, we would after every single Sabbath, we would go home and we'd just be like so. I mean, Saturday was by far the worst day of the week for me. So would you would you say it was the most exhausting day of the week for you? Oh, hands the most, down, the most and restless day. You leave home hands with down. time and get home with time. Okay, so. It, 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 it was awful. <laughs> so I am You'd be often there at eight and asked, get home at ten. <laughs> what, oh, of, ten would be a good time to get home. What one of the first things that if you're a Christian, if you're anybody who's approached by this group, 
or for me, one of the first, one of the most prominent primary things I hear on YouTube from WMSCOG members is, is accusations or questions like, why do you disobey the Sabbath? Why do you break the Sabbath? Or why don't you keep the fourth commandment? Or, or where in the Bible does it say to, uh, to worship on Sunday and not on Saturday? And so I, I just want to, I just want to honestly, genuine, sincerely ask you guys, where in the Bible does it say that, that Kelsey just described is what the Sabbath is about? Where in the Bible is the Sabbath about any of those things? And so my question would be, why do you guys break the Sabbath in that way? And your experience might be a little bit different than Kelsey's, but I think, again, if you're honest, your, your experience is very similar. And I, I think your experience of the Sabbath is not something that is promoting you to be restful, which is what the command, the fourth commandment is all about. The commandment is to rest. The commandment of God on the fourth day isn't just to do some religious thing on Saturday. The commandment of God that goes back to Genesis, the creation, is to rest, to rest in God. And so where in the Bible does it say to do what Kelsey just described? And again, I'm asking you, you're asking me where in the Bible does it say to keep Sabbath on Sunday, which again, I have to say this over and over. I don't keep Sabbath on Sunday. I don't think Sunday is the new Sabbath. Uh, that's that's a, a false assumption. But where in the Bible does it tell you to be restless on the Sabbath? Where in the and, Bible and Jordan, does it say to do these things that will make you exhausted? And, and something else really important. I know you're going to amen this one too. Um, we talk about the burden, you know, of being a member and, and just how it sucks your life and time and money and soul away and the guilt and the pressure. But on top of that, you know, a lot of people leave this group to become bitter atheists and agnostics. Yep. And you can see right. why, because they just crack and break under the law that yep. you're not supposed to be under. You're supposed to have, you know, peace and rest. But this group is just grinding you to a little nub and there's mm -hmm. nothing. And then you crack. And believe it, Jordan and you're and I not going to want to go back Kelsey, to that. We're not telling oh, no. you to leave the group to get away from this burden. What did, the verse I just read is the promise yeah. of Christ where he says, come to him where the burden is light. Not just leave the cult and go live a godless life where you're bitter at God for the bad decision that you made to stay in this group too long without looking into the stuff that we're trying to share with you today. But instead, you know, the, the other option is to do, look, go to the, you were, you were in the group. I often tell people, you know, you joined this group for a reason. You were looking for something to meet your spiritual needs. And you didn't just join for no reason. When you joined this group, you know, remember why you went into the first place. You were seeking to know God. Well, there is a real God and his burden is light. Don't just leave and become discouraged and ignore mm -hmm. the real God and turn your back on him, you know, come to the real God. That, that's, that's a great point. And, and this, this is another question I get asked often and I hear asked is, okay, you're telling us to leave this group. So what other church is teaching you the truth? So what church should we go to then? That's kind of, that's a common question I get. And here's what I'm telling you. Um, I'm not, we're not telling you to go to another church or like go and find the right denomination or the, or the one organization that's got it right. We're doing it's this. A hymn. It's we're a telling hymn. you, yes, we're telling you to go to Jesus, go to the one who can give you rest. And, and hopefully that will turn into finding a, a group of believers you can fellowship with. But we're not telling you that this this organization, this church is the wrong church and you need to get out and, and find the true church. Like that that's a that's it's just leave the a false silly Jesus, way of thinking about leave it. Leave the false Jesus and turn to the right. real Jesus. And yes, so this stuff right. is grounded the, the 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 pain that you're feeling, what I'm saying here, where you know in your heart about the fear, guilt, and shame, where does that come from? That comes from bad theology. The reason that you have that fear, guilt, and shame is not just because some of the excesses of a group, it's because this group is grounded in bad theology. If it was rooted, rooted in good theology, you wouldn't have fear, guilt, and shame. This is a byproduct of a whole false belief system. Right. A false prophet. This is, a, this is an organization of false prophets. It is so easily testable. Do false prophets predict the end of the world and it doesn't happen like the Jehovah's Witnesses have done six times or more? Yeah, your group has done it three times. 
automatically on that grounds alone, alone, they have failed the test of God's prophet. If they did that in the Old Testament times, they would have been taken outside of Jerusalem and stoned according to Deuteronomy 18. They would have been given a second chance after they predicted in the world in 1988 and put out tracts and literature on that and told people the world's going to end in 88. They would have had a chance to predict it a couple more times. That would have been game over. And that's that's God's standard. You can't just keep on making false prophecies. And now you're trying to cover up for it. This stuff is out there. You don't have to be with a false prophet who's going to give you this fear, guilt, and shame. You can have freedom where Christ's burden is light and an abundant life that you, you've you been seeking, but you've been looking in the wrong place. And that that's, yeah, that's that's why we're doing these things. That's why we're having these conversations. That's why we said everything we just said. And, and Kelsey sharing her, her story which is so significant, not just not just Kelsey sharing her story, but sharing her specific experience of the Sabbath. This thing that is so central and core to the World Mission Society Church of God that if you just examine the experience of members, you see that 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 they are doing the the exact opposite. Uh, of keeping the Sabbath, like uh, with all their passion and zeal for the Sabbath, they are completely missing it. They are completely denying the very purpose of it. The Sabbath rest. <laughs> how rested, Kelsey? How rested did you feel at ten o'clock at night after getting home from that? Where was your well, rest? For, first of all, I was never home by. I was not home by ten o'clock at night. It was not home by ten o'clock at night. But how was your? Um, how did that Sabbath rest work out for you? Oh, how was that working was, for you? Uh, it was, it, there was it no wasn't rest. Restful. It was brutal. Yeah, it, no it, you know, it took weekend. a lot of caffeine to get through those days. And it was like, I, again, it got to the point where I was like, you know what? I'm done. And I just, I, I dipped out halfway through a Sabbath day and, and, you know, never came back. You people so, lie to themselves while they're in there. Just like you said a minute ago, right? you, you knew about the fear, the guilt, the shame that you mm-hmm. live by from your leadership, always putting you down. But you're and afraid to leave. The time. Right. You're yeah, Exactly. But you know, and you're lying to yourself about the Sabbath rest being a day of rest. It's far mm-hmm. from rest. It's like I couldn't do it, and you know whether I do. It's just it's insane. And then you have you know lying to yourself about the the psychological pressure and everything. I saw your video about the forty percent of the money. It's just like, guys, mm-hmm. you know this is a fraud. Come yep. to the real God. Right. No. And and you you see these things, but you know at the I mean I saw these things you too, and I saw even and I saw even worse things. And you know there was like a million red flags, and I looked pa- I saw them, recognized them, and chose to look past them because at the end of the day I was like, okay, Cognitive maybe I don't dissonance. understand the whole story, and if I you know where else am I gonna go? And if I leave, I'm gonna go to hell. Like they like yeah. I said this before, they have an actual study that says apart from me you can do nothing, and they teach. If you leave the church of God, it's not like necessarily like if you just like, you know, leave God. It's like if you leave the church of God, your life is going to be awful. You're going to get mm. cancer. You're going to get into an accident. You know, something bad is going to happen to you. And um, and even if something bad doesn't happen to you right away, it will happen. Like people because like sometimes people say like, oh, well, you know, where there's like a big hurricane or a big, you know, tsunami. You know, there's tons of people who live who never kept the Passover. And they said those people live because they got lucky. Their time is coming. Mm. And so because they didn't keep the Passover. And so like you get so scared that if I OK, if I leave and I don't do what they say, then something bad's going to happen. And again, for me, it got to the point where I'm like, you know what? They told me this a million times and, you know, my life's already awful as it is. So I might as well just leave. And I just was, I was convinced at first that, okay, something bad's going to happen. I'm going to go to hell. But, you know, I got, I'm taking that chance. And then eventually, you know, that the, the power that they had over me, you know, wore down because I wasn't there. Um, but and it took, took some time, took some time. So for those so. who who are making these claims or accusations against Christians or, or those who aren't keeping the Sabbath, those who are worshiping on Sunday, and, and you so vehemently attack and, and accuse and slander, or whatever word you want to use, those people saying, you guys are breaking the fourth commandment, um, listen, you guys are breaking the fourth commandment. I think in a in a so much more clear and evident way than we are. Um, you're you're doing the direct opposite of what the commandment requires. The fourth commandment is all about rest. That is the commandment. It's a command to rest. And so when you, the organization itself is forcing its members to 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 
do on the seventh day on the Sabbath the, to make it become the most unrestful day of their week, that's a clear sign that you're not keeping the Sabbath the way you yeah. think you are. And so this isn't be this isn't being said as like a uh, an attack or an insult or like we're just trying to make you look bad. We're saying stop, stop for a second and just think about what we're saying right now. Mm-hmm. We're saying this because there is a rest. <laughs> there is a Sabbath rest. And, and it's what Steve read earlier. It, it's, it's again, go, go to the true Jesus. The true Jesus isn't going to give you an experience of restlessness. Jesus promised rest. He promised uh, an experience uh, of Christianity that is light and easy and not without difficulty, not without trials, not without struggles. That's not what I'm saying, but, but there is a restfulness in him, a true peace. Um, that, that agnosticism that, cannot deliver. He's not just saying this right. in the context of your, if you're part of a, a burdensome group who stacks on law upon law upon law, you know, it's it's not in that context. It's for the person who doesn't even believe in God whatsoever. You know, so your choice is like Jordan's saying. It's not like you're just gonna, you know, be more restful by being an agnostic yeah. with no church. And for the person with no church, you still can have burdens that can be eliminated by coming to the real God. Yep, that's what Jesus is saying. So and it's even not, you even understand the whole. Con- even an indulgence and in sin. So it's it's like it, it's it, Jesus is calling us in that statement out of any way of living that is independent from Him. He's not just saying you know. So again, we're not just saying get out of this group. We're saying go to the only one who can give you rest. And that's it would be the same thing if you leave the group and you just say, well, I guess there's no God. I'm just going to go and and you know indulge in all these inward desires that I've had for so long and thought I couldn't enjoy. And you just go and kind of live your life and, and, and do whatever you want to do. And, uh, it's not that either. Like Jesus calls you to people to come out and find rest from that, because that's not going to give you rest. I I guarantee you the end of that road isn't You're just going to fill it with something Um, else. Yeah. So, so any, yeah, Jesus, Jesus is calling us from, uh, out of the bondage and the burden of a life that is lived independently from him because Jesus, he is, he himself is our peace is what Paul says in Ephesians. Like he, he's the only source of peace. He's our Sabbath rest. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. It says in Hebrews. Yep. Right. And, and, you know, the great, the, the great expert on cults, you know, the late Walter Martin would say that, you know, guys, you have just bought the deception it's not just the fact that, you know, you really messed up by looking at this group and now you're looking at how you've really subjugated yourself to a life of burdens and guilt and fear and shame. You know, it's like, you know, they're the ones who are really bad. Your leadership of your group has put you under these laws and burdens, worse than the Pharisees could imagine. And, you know, you just bought the deception. Well, now it's time to move on and find the real Christ because, you know, the New Testament's really clear. There's lots of Jesuses running around. And right. it's like, what do you mean? Well, Paul says in, you know, Second Corinthians, he goes, I fear for you lest you might go to another spirit, another gospel, another Christ. And there's a false Christ of Mormonism. There's a false Christ of the Baha'is or Jehovah's Witnesses or so many different groups. And there's a false Christ of the World Mission High Church of God. It's a deception. And, you know, the fruit, you know, the, fr- the fruit of a false prophet comes out in the way mm-hmm. you live. And you can see what the fruit is for you. You know, yep. uh, you know, you could take a poll among Christians and, you know, we don't live, you know, I don't have any fear, guilt or any burdens like that. And, you know, I, you know, I answer directly to the Lord and it's very different because you know yourself as you try to put on that face that you're so happy, you know what you're going through inside and it's a grind. You're not looking forward right. to next Sabbath. Right. Yep. Jesus, Jesus talked about specifically in the context of talking about false teaching talks about how you will know them by their fruits and you you can know you know what the type of tree it is by the type of fruit it produces and so i think everything we've kind of said in this last section is just pointing you to think more clearly more critically more honestly think about the fruit that is being born by this organization and and it's and and, and many of the members the uh, fruit of restlessness 
a fruit of doing good works before others, of, of having to call news stations before you go out and do, do things. Um, so many things that again, Steve, as you said earlier, going, if you just go and read through the Sermon of the Mount, read through the Sermon of the Mount, look at the kind of character Jesus pushed his followers toward and compare that to the character that you see being produced <clears throat> um, in the world mission society of church of god and i think if you're honest you're going to see a stark contrast